Okay, it shows that we are live and I'm just going to verify that that is correct because I'm very skeptical. I want to make sure it's working. Uh, so uh, good morning to anybody who uh, is joining us for a discussion about history this morning. We have a special guest, so that is very exciting. So it does look like we are live on the Gorgas House Museum. I'm going to hop over to the Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum to make sure everything is working properly over there. Uh, we are streaming to three different platforms this morning. So we're going to be live on the Gorgas House Museum's Facebook page and the Warner Transportation Museum's Facebook page. And we are also live on the UA Museum's YouTube channel. So uh, let me verify that as well, because uh, I know some people uh, prefer to watch things on YouTube. Uh, sometimes I think on smart TVs, it's a little e easier to watch through YouTube. So you can watch on YouTube. Uh, just search for UA Museums on YouTube and you will find us. All right. So it does look like we are live and working properly on all of our platforms and channels. So I guess we will get started. Welcome to today's Museums from Your Home live stream presented by the University of Alabama Museums. My name is Rebecca Johnson and I am the communication specialist for UA Museums. And joining us for a discussion about history today are Catherine Edge, director of the Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum and Brandon Thompson, director of the Gorgas House Museum. Uh, welcome back to the live stream, Catherine and Brandon. Good morning. Thank Hope you so much, happy to be well. here. All right, and Brandon, I see we have a guest. Would you like to introduce her? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, today we are joined by Dr. Julia Brock, assistant professor in the uh, University of Alabama's Department of History. She has some fantastic uh, research interests and, and has done a lot of incredible work in her field. And I'm really looking forward to today's conversation, uh, not just talking about public history, but a few other of her research interests as well. So I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Well, that's awesome. Well, welcome, Julia. Thank you for being part of what we're doing here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a privilege to be here. Well, great. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to uh, your discussion about history, and I'll probably learn something uh, as we go. <laughs> so uh, while we are broadcasting, uh, feel free to ask us any questions. You can drop them in the comment section. And remember, this is all live, so anything can happen. Uh, so hang in with us in case Facebook has any issues or YouTube has any issues or we have any issues. Hopefully that will not be the case. But uh, just as a reminder, this is live. Uh, so feel free to uh, drop any questions or uh, comments that you might have in the comments section. All right. Well, now that we've gotten all of our business out of the way, uh, Brandon, what are you guys going to be talking about today? Well, uh, in general, uh, we're going to be talking about public history, but also a few of uh, Dr. Brock's other interests. Uh, we're going to start off just learning a little bit more about Dr. Brock and kind of what her background is. Uh, so, Dr. Brock, can you tell us a little bit uh, about your background and how did you come to teach? Well, sure. Thank you. And thank you all for having me. It's so good to see you. Um, I am from Northwest Georgia. I um, got my undergraduate degree at the University of Georgia. Um, and I, while I was an undergraduate, um, I learned about the field of public history. So I stumbled into a public history class and I was electrified. I had no idea that you could be a historian and um, work in other kinds of venues than say a classroom uh, teach. Um, of course, I'm doing that now and I'll come back to that. But I um, learned very quickly that one needed a, a master's degree to continue on in the field of public history. And so I pursued a master's degree at Florida State University in public history and historical administration as it was called then, and then decided when I was at FSU that I still had questions about public history, uh, more theoretical questions. Quest I wanted to deepen my practice and engagement with the field. And so I actually uh, went on to pursue a public, uh, a PhD in public history. And at the time, um, there weren't very many of those in uh, the United States. I chose to go out to UC Santa Barbara, which has one of the older programs in the field, um, and finished my PhD, moved back to Georgia. Um, and what I, what I thought about or what I imagined about my own life was that I would actually be a practitioner, that I would work in museums, uh, perhaps, or historic society, historical societies, um, in and throughout the South, but a, and, and, and indeed my first job was at a small museum at Kennesaw State University, a small Holocaust and World War II museum. Um, and while I was there, a, a tenure track job opened up at the University of West Georgia. Uh, and so I, I applied and I, that sort of began my teaching career, uh, full-time teaching career. I did, did teach some at Kennesaw State. And, you know, I, 
I've been really, and, and I'd be interested to hear what y'all think about this as practitioners who are based at a university and in a university system. I've been really um, excited by the opportunities that that brings being a practitioner at a larger institution where you're surrounded by intellectuals, you're surrounded by a number of different initiatives. Um, and I will say that as, as sort of a final note on, on why I love teaching, you know, at some point, I think I was in pursuing in the early years of my doctorate program, I saw, I went to a, an American Association for State and Local History Conference, and I saw a panel on public history in the academy, and um, a, a public historian who's who's based in Kansas, who's based in sort of the Midwest. I remember kind of presented public history as sort of like being an, an extension agent, right? So if you're based at a university, it's like you're an extension agent of history, right? You can take on any number of kinds of projects and serve the public in ways that you might not be able to at a smaller institution. Um, and I really, I find that that to be true and that kind of an inspiring vision for what we can do as public historians based at a university. Um, but again, I'd be curious to know what y'all think about that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a fantastic question because uh, at these universities, especially one like the University of Alabama that has you know, almost 200 years worth of history, uh, there's a lot to talk about. And, you know, as people who work in museums, and it's really our responsibility not only for preservation and conservation, but also to engage the public and share these different histories. And it gives us the possibility to explore many different narratives. So as, as opposed to like the one monolithic uh, story that we might present about specific types of history, what I've come to find out doing all these public engagement exercises is that, that each person, each social group has a way of interpreting what histories are important to them in these public spaces. Mm -hmm. And so it gives us an opportunity to not only to explore each of those, but really to allow our visitors to make meaning in these historic spaces uh, based on their own backgrounds. Um, so that, that's, that's been, um, I guess, one of the more illuminating experiences I've had so far is that just each person, each group can really define what history means to them based on what these public, spe um, public experiences are. Yeah. I would, um, yeah, I would agree with that because, um, you know, Brandon um, at the Gorgas House Museum is, um, you know, very focused on, um, or, you know, initially the foundation is, you know, very focused on university history, the Gorgas family themselves. And, uh, you know, that that creates, you know, his foundation at the Transportation Museum. Our foundation is the history of Tuscaloosa. So um, having the opportunity to, um, you know, through, well, the history of Tuscaloosa through the lens of transportation. Um, so being able to, um, you know, kind of vacillate back and forth between, um, you know, is it is it strictly Tuscaloosa history? Is it is it a more regional history? Is it a transportation aspect of history? Um, you know, we we are fortunate at the at the museum to have that kind of flexibility and um you know while also sharing um information uh, you know from the gorgas house we've ho we've hosted exhibits down at the transportation museum that the um that the gorgas house has has developed and put on in order to reach a broader audience and um and we're you know, we we have the ability to do that because we have so much flexibility in the types of history that we're able to to talk about. It's not just a a one you know one direct path. There are um, we have our foundation, but then there's uh, there's a variety of ways that we can tangent off of that. Again, as Brandon said, to try to create as much um, opportunity for the community to engage in whatever way they find meaningful, and um, and that's that's really exciting, and it opens up it opens up so many possibilities and being a part of a larger system like the university provides um, just immense resources, um, resources that may, may not otherwise be available. And, and having, you know, having the, you can have a wonderful, wonderful idea and a fantastic concept. But if you, if, if you don't have the resources to bring that into fruition, to make that tangible, um, then it, you know, it, it might just stay an idea. And so having, having the combination of all of that together really, um, you know, gives us an opportunity to be fantastic and wonderful and um, mean a variety of things to a variety of different groups. And I, I think that's, I think that's where we all are. Um, I, I think that's why museums and, and public history and the way they work together are incredibly important to, uh, to communities and um, to our, our overall society, really. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we, we've kicked around this term a couple of times, you know, public history. And I'm curious, you know, Dr. Brock, how would you define public history? Can you tell us a little bit more about the field in general? 
Yeah, I mean, there are there are multiple ways to define it. You know, is it is it a methodology? Is it a, a set of you know career trajectories? Um, but I think at its heart, you know, public history is a way is about the way that the public engages the past, uh, and and about you know how the past is represented to the public. Um, it's about the the histories that the public creates. It's about preserving the the past in the present, you know, for the future. <laughs> um, and it's certainly about the way that the past is used in contemporary society and its audiences, right? Um, I think public historians are active in that, in both the kind of making of and analysis of, I guess, historical representation. Um, so it, it, that's kind of a broad way to define it, Brandon, and we can certainly, maybe, I think all of us could speak to the ways we've feel like we we, feel, we would define it as our through our practice um, uh, but but sort of broadly thinking that's that's how I'd start yeah I think that's a really good definition and I think its flexibility is one of its strengths especially in terms of its interpretation and I'm sure if you asked many different historians uh, academics uh, museum professionals they would probably have their own individual take on it. And, and I echo a lot of the same sentiments you do and you know working at the Gorgas house, as it is a museum focused, our job and our responsibility is to engage the public. And it is all these different histories and historic narratives, all these lenses, really. That's really our responsibility. And while we have a core mission, like Catherine was talking about, this foundation of what of what our core idea is supposed to be, talking about the Gorgas family, uh, we have the opportunity, working in an academic setting, to engage uh, not only the other museum professionals, museum professionals and academics, but also students, and really allow them to conduct their own research, uh, and let it let the space kind of speak for itself, but also kind of be an adjacent or even a contributing member to what history might mean for them. Uh, so yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think with it, that's flexibility is one of its strengths in terms of its definition. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you know, you've got a couple of different uh, other research interests, uh, including Southern history and the history of uh, sporting and leisure. Um, and some of your individual projects, such as, you know, hunting and game law, the New South and the heirs property in the New South, uh, community engaged public history works. Um, these are fascinating subjects that have resulted in some really great scholarship. Uh, so can you tell us about your approach to teaching and getting students involved in these uh, research interests? Yeah, I mean, um, so I, you know, I, I came to the University of Alabama to, to begin a public history program uh, that's going to be housed in the in the history department. And, you know, we're kind of taking these small steps. One of the ways that I'm introducing public history is by teaching public history courses. And certainly, you know, John Giggy, Dr. John Giggy in our department was already um, doing that. And, and not only John Giggy, Dr. Sharon Green, uh, Dr. Kerry Fredrickson, you know, these folks who are already engaging students in public history work um, and, and many others, by the way. Um, so I think that, you know, I approach teaching, thinking about the question of engaging students. I think one thing, and, and y'all, I'd love to hear y'all talk about this because you work with students with internships and in a number of ways. I think public history practice actually brings an interesting perspective to teaching in a classroom. And, uh, you know, I'm actually working, I'm co-editing a volume on public history pedagogy, uh, actually, as we speak. And so I'm, I, this, is, this is one of my research interests, you know, how do we as teachers of public history actually help define the field through the ways that we approach uh, our classes and our, and our pedagogy. Um, but I definitely try to engage students um, by using traditional, by using kind of um, the ethical prerogatives, I guess, of public history practice. Of course, one of those is, is what we call sharing authority, right? Which is simply the idea that as a public historian, you actually share ground with your partners in any given project or your stakeholders in any given project. So, you know, I approach the classroom in a very similar way. I think of my students as co-creators and co-learners in these research projects. And so they, you know, they, they have a voice in, and they have a, a creative role in shaping whatever research project we're working on. And so I, I build that as an ethic into the classroom in a number of different ways, but um, it, it brings us together as a team, you know, um, and I, I so enjoy approaching the classroom in that way, as opposed to me sort of representing an authority, right, or an expertise that, in fact, um, you know, they bring their own perspectives and skill sets and capabilities to the classroom. And I think all of that together um, allows them to kind of take a, have stake in the project that they may not otherwise have. Um, 
but at the heart of the matter, you know, the heart of what we do is is good historical research, you know, and and, and in, you know multidisciplinary research for sure. But in um, well, in many of the public history projects, we're starting as we're, we're grounded as historians, and we approach our projects in that way. So also bringing those skill sets into the classroom, training students to be the best historians. In fact, because the stakes are higher, right? When you're producing something for public audiences, you want that to be compelling, accurate. Um, good storytelling. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, again, kind of broad, um, but but I really love um, thinking about the classroom as another kind of engaged space, just as y'all might with your exhibitions and your public programs and all the cool community work that you do. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I completely echo those sentiments. So this the idea that you have a subject which might be history, but in terms of your uh, research partners, they are participants in creating this research and creating the information that you want to talk about. And I've had a lot of fun, uh, you know, Catherine and I both had the privilege and the pleasure of coming in and sitting with one of your classes to talk about it. And you have these more active learning exercises that just aren't, you know, lectures or chalks and talks and that kind of thing. So it's been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I had the, the pleasure of participating with one of your students I think a week or so ago in a, in a podcast uh, exercise, which was a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to her putting that together, which has been which has been great. So you know you you know you're working with various departments and entities around the university, including the museum systems. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what other departments and programs you're working with, and uh, what are some of the projects you're developing? Sure. Um, so I am right now. Um, Working on so one of the projects I'm working on that's ongoing that began this summer is um, with a colleague actually in the history department, Lawrence Capello. He he came on board with me in the fall of 2018. He's a legal he's our legal historian here in the department. Um, he just wrote a great book on privacy. I feel like I should plug that. It's amazing the history of privacy in the 20th century. It's really cool and timely. Um, but he and I are working with the Birmingham Bar Association to interview to conduct oral history interviews with. Um, uh, long-term members of the bar uh, in the state. And so they, it, it's been fa fascinating. So we've only done one to date because of COVID. Uh, our, the project was put on hold, but we interviewed Bill Baxley, who was the uh, former attorney general of the state in the 1970s. And he has this like fascinating story of, you know, for a number of different reasons in the 1970s, he, he opened uh, cold cases, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, cold cases from the civil rights movement. So uh, it was under his tenure that men were indicted for the 16th Street bombing, 16th Street uh, Baptist Church bombing in Birmingham. But he also um, introduced the first kind of, he gave the first sort of teeth to environmental uh, legislation in the state. So Lawrence and I and students um, are interviewing, you know, these really interesting people who have have had a role to play in the state's history. Many of them are also UA alum. So we get to kind of also talk about the history of the University of Alabama. Um, and the Birmingham Bar Association really wanted to do this to capture their, the history of the Bar Association, but also to, to make sure that they captured stories of longtime jurists um, who have practiced in the city uh, for many years. And so we look forward to continuing that. Um, I'm also a, a fellow with the Collaborative Arts Research Initiative, which is a new program um, in uh, the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, it's an, uh, there are Hillary Green, Dr. Hillary Green is also a fellow, um, and, and of course other colleagues throughout the college. Um, it's based in Maxwell Hall, and it's this really interesting initiative that is um, providing you know, funding for those of us who are blending uh, arts-based research with uh, in collaborative ways. So that project has really allowed for me to kind of make connections across campus, and it also has been the germ for new projects. So I am working with um, uh, a, a sculptor here, Jamie Grimes, also a UA instructor based in the, in the arts department. Y'all may know, I don't know if y'all know Jamie, he's wonderful. Um, and we are partnering with Friends of Hurricane Creek um, and also other entities on campus um, to think about ways that we could do kind of a public arts, public history based community participatory programming around the success of Hurricane Creek in really saving, um, you know, bringing back to life, resuscitating a branch of the Black Warrior River, right? So how do we bring attention to kind of environmental concerns at a moment of climate crisis? How do we do that with the public in kind of exciting and engaging ways? So that's unfolding as we speak. Um, that project also involves, and um, I don't want to go on too long, but that project also involves a, a, a collective I'm a part of. Uh, we call ourselves a curatorial collective. We, we call ourselves Selvage. Um, and that's with me and, and two um, art 
arts curate, art, contemporary art curators and artists. They're based in Atlanta and um, Maryland. And we, uh, they're also uh, bringing um, um, kind of thought and creative process to this Hurricane Creek project. But my work with them goes back, you know, five years or so at this point. So those are some of the projects that are ongoing. There's some others kind of in the hopper um, that you know may unfold uh, over the course of the year. A project with Marion, City of Marion, um, and also actually a project with uh, the Division of Museums. You know we're um, we're now a part of a of a National Park Service cooperative agreement, um, and so Matt Gage and I have been in conversation with the Park Service to think about how we might bring you know all that we have to offer with, with the College of Arts and Sciences to bear on cultural resources projects with the Park service so that's that's ongoing as well that's fantastic there's there's a lot i could dive deep into but each one of those sounds like a fantastic uh, you know project in and of itself and uh, what i love about all you're talking about is just the breadth that public history can engage with and it isn't just um, history specific but it has the opportunity to engage and collaborate with all these different fields cultural resources management um, agriculture uh, national park service the ccc research potentially even as well so i think it's really speaking to the strength of that there is always a way to communicate and engage with different audiences and different groups and uh, i guess i'm going to bring it back to our discussion of what does it mean to be a historian or engage with history in an academic setting. What I found is that it provides you the opportunity to collaborate and engage with other experts and professionals in their fields that you otherwise never would have had to. And that has been a huge benefit. You know, at, at the Gorgas, being able to work with the Department of History and Race and Gender Studies, the theater and costume, fashion and interior design. There are all these different ways to bring these historic elements into a single space and really approach history from many different avenues and venues. Uh, it's been it's been a real pleasure and it's a real treat. And I think you echo a lot of those same sentiments. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, yeah, oh, please. Yeah. I, let me just, I, I want to follow up on that really quickly, Brandon. Um, I think you raised two kind of, you know, pieces of public history practice that are so critical. Um, one is collaboration, right? Everything we do is collaborative. Um, and yeah, multidisciplinary work. And I think that's what makes public history exciting for so many people who are interested in the field is that you really, you know, you're, you, you can be trained in a, with a number of different skill sets um, and bring those to bear, but you're also working with other experts. I mean, I think about both of you and I know something about your backgrounds. And so I know you both have diverse backgrounds in where you've practiced and where you started and now what you're bringing to your respective institutions. You know, Brandon, you're trained as, you know, you've worked in archaeology and CRM, and so you're bringing a whole new perspective to kind of the interpretive work at the Gorgas House. And Catherine, you know, you have this long history and it's multidisciplinary. You've worked in, you know, you've worked in an agency that, that, um, that oversaw multiple different kinds of, of historic places and all that you bring to that in, in the Western Belt Museum. And so kind of even our own backgrounds are diverse um, as we go through our careers and, and kind of what we how that might change our practice as we go along. Yeah, I think that leads into one of uh, Catherine's questions, and I want to go ahead and skip on down to that because I think it ties in really nicely with this part of the conversation, is that it really seems like there's no real linear um, process or a linear path to getting into history or public history or museums here and whatever happens to be so what advice would you have for students who are thinking about uh, being a history major yeah i mean i think um i think that i would i i would proselytize for students to become history majors and think about public history uh, because of all that, you know, because of the things we've been talking about and the ways that, you know, it, it really is about civic engagement, right? It, it, it's not just about becoming a historian, but it's about being a community member um, and engaging civically with other community members. Um, but I think that uh, many of us who have in the, you know, in the field, maybe you all too, have these kind of stumbling in narratives, like we just sort of stumbled into these fields that we didn't know were fields, right, or our career options. And so I think that now, you know, what's amazing about UA is that we have dedicated programs programs to train students who are interested in these fields. You know, we have an anthropology department where one can learn cultural resources management. I'm building a public history program at the graduate level. Of course, we have, you know, the uh, museum studies certificate. So I think that what's so cool about where we are is that we have a number of different ways for students to become involved, not simply in the classroom, but in, you know, with internships, with you all in the Division of Museums and, and in 
Tuscaloosa and beyond, right? So we have a number of different resources um, just in our persons, but also in the, re, uh, you know, the, the places uh, and programs we have to get students uh, involved in thinking about their own training. And we should also not neglect archival studies too in, in libraries, right? That they have a, a different training program, which is, a, you know, used to be considered sort of a subset of public history, but it, of course it's a field in its own right, um, archival studies and, and you know, um, um, library science. So yeah, we should champion those to students interested. Yes, yeah, so not only archives, but also I have to give a shout out to my, uh, to our colleagues in the, Research and Collections Department. Uh, and, uh, curatorial work is yes. part and parcel of what we do. You know, we, we go into the decisions of what are we going to put out to talk about? How do we engage with these individual pieces? Gets into preservation and conservation efforts. All of me that there's so many diverse fields, so many multidisciplinary efforts that can go into just just history alone. Uh, it's fascinating to think about, and uh, you know, I would encourage anybody who's interested to pursue them. Um, reach out to someone like us. Reach out to your local museums or arts galleries there's there's a way to enter the field and it isn't linear and whatever experiences you have i, I would definitely encourage people to do the same thing um so catherine do you have something you wanted to say well i was just gonna say you know the the museum field itself is is also like that um you know it's not it's not just the um the the artifacts or the if it's an art gallery the images you know um the the artworks hanging on the wall or um, you know, making up the gallery. There, there are so many museums themselves are just so interdisciplinary because you've got, um, you know, educators, um, you know, a variety, you know, people with an education background are very useful to museums because that's how programs are developed. Graphic designers, um, finance backgrounds, you know, all, all of that can be um, and there are a slew other, a slew of others that I know I'm, I'm forgetting. Um, in the moment, but um, but there are so many different components and professions that can all come together in museums themselves that that make the institutions work, and um, and so that that's something else to consider too. You know, if you're if you're a graphic designer, you work in public relations, or um, you've even got a um, you know a construction background. How do you think exhibits get built? You know, how do how do you think things are fabricated? Um, you know, it it all it all works together. So, um, so I I try to um, with uh, as many students as I can. I try to remind them that you know it it the, depending on your background, there may be a place in the museum world for you as a professional and uh, to, you know, not, not necessarily discredit that when they're, uh, particularly when they're looking for, uh, looking for positions um, in, in any, any capacity. So um, I see we have, uh, we have a question from Stephen. It says, uh, for historical purposes, what will we want to preserve from the pandemic? That's a very interesting question. Yeah, Dr. Brock, do you want to? You yeah, that? in fact, I was just chatting here because I, I shared with Rebecca, if she doesn't mind showing this website, just that's a great question, um, Stephen. Nice to see you on the chat or hear, hear from you on the chat. But public historians are absolutely already thinking about this. So I just shared a, a URL um, of a public history, of an oral history project, rather, that's being run by Dr. Jason Kelly out of IUPUI. Um, he and a, a team of folks put together um, a, a COVID oral history project um, where one can share their own experience or one can actually do some interviewing of people. So I think what's really fascinating to public historians and certainly will be to, to historians in the future is the sort of day-to-day -day experience of the pandemic. Um, but I know that other you know, entities are undoubtedly collecting um, you know, any number of, of, uh, of, of material, you know, pieces of material culture as well. So um, the what, first thing that comes to mind is the CDC. Um, the CDC, you know, has its own museum staff. It has a museum on campus. That staff is, uh, the, the collection is curated by Louise Shaw. Um, and I'm sure that Louise, who was active in collecting during the Ebola uh, outbreak, for example, in Africa, I'm sure Louise and her team are, you um, thinking about what to save and, and what not to save. I also know that the Library of Congress has, um, has a division that is archiving, um, you know, all kinds of, of, of digital, uh, you know, digital um, ephemera. So memes and websites and other kinds of uh, creative production coming out of the pandemic and other types of sites. So I think that a collection is happening now and I think it's happening in, in sort of a wide range. 
Well, there, so, and, and, there definitely won't be a lack of uh, digital media, I think, out of this as right. I mean, this this project uh, itself is a is a result of the um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So I, um, I I certainly don't envy those curators the uh, the job that they have because there is uh, so much digital media that is now available um, as a result as a result of this. So that's that's yeah, a very then, interesting question. Yeah, and then to kind of follow up on all this digital media, all this digital uh, information, we as physical spaces on the landscape, we have an opportunity to provide a physical location for people to talk about these experiences. So I can already envision you know, working with students on campus uh, or also down in the Transportation Museum, letting them create and construct their own uh, historic experiences from what this happens to be and really providing them a medium to do that in a physical location. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's kind of piggybacks off that the digital experiences um, of uh, the COVID experience. Let's see. All right, we've got another question. Uh, Catherine, I'll let you take this one. All right, so uh, James says, um, how do you share public history with visitors or students whom you might not readily share lived experiences with or that history narrative that is not part of your experience? Okay. Um, so um, Julia, do you want to you want to weigh in? That's a really great question, James. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I think one of the goals of I, th I think of any historical education and and uh, I don't want to sound too Pollyanna here, but I actually do believe this is the the ability that that historical narratives can have to create sort of empathy, um, empathy for the experience of others. Right. And I think public history, uh, by virtue of the ways that we practice it, is like prime, a prime way that one can do that. Um, and, you know, there are different strategies for that. And I, you know, I would I would cede to the public historians uh, in our conversation about how you all do that. But I think this is something we think about as, as, as part of the ethical landscape of our work, right? That we tell stories that are about people that exactly don't share our cultural experience. And we share them with sometimes audience members who, who we, whom we don't share cultural backgrounds or historic backgrounds with. So it's a great question. I'd, I'd be curious to know what you all say, I have to say about that. Uh, sure, I'll take this one. Uh, you know, the Gorgas House has many different histories that it speaks to, and one of them is the participation of the university in the institution of slavery. And from a professional standpoint, I simply give the factual information based on the archival research that we've been able to do. But from other standpoints, um, and I guess if we're going to get to the idea that um, like disagreement and constructing different narratives, the Gorgas House serves as a cultural resource. It belongs to everyone and anyone who can come in, no matter what their diverse background might be, is going to create meaning out of it in their own way. So uh, on, the, on the surface level, it's just presenting the, the facts based on the historical and archival research we've done and letting people understand their own, uh, understand those histories their own way. Um, you know, for those individuals who want to dive deeper into it, uh, for histories that aren't relevant or histories that don't speak exactly to what my social, cultural, or historic backgrounds might happen to be, the voice I give them is just one of support. I can't be that voice of change per se, but I can provide a physical space for them to explore these histories. And if they're creating an exhibit, uh, student research or different professors, whatever, whatever happens to might, might be, we provide a physical space that has uh, an attachment to these historical narratives and allow them to, co to construct and explore those histories in their own way. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, the the transportation being, you know, museum being the, the local history museum uh, gives us the opportunity to, um, you know, present uh, present factual information to the best and most accurately you know to to our ability um but then the way that that is then interpreted by the visitors that come in is um is then open you know open to open to discussion um because we can we can present the information as we know it and as we understand it um from a factual point of view but how that then is um interpreted by a visitor is um is then where the we you know where the growth happens where the opportunity happens and um and those 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 discussions are very important to have and so that um that level of engagement um is uh, is a available through um you know through through our physical mediums and through uh now through you know uh, more readily through digital mediums as well so they all work together to um they all work together to um aid all of us in uh, developing a shared experience where there may not um, have um, initially been one 
Yeah, and, and I'll follow up on that just a little bit more and say when we are creating exhibits, and you can you both uh, I'm gonna probably echo the same sentiment and give your own experiences to it, but when we're creating an exhibit or exploring these different histories, it is imperative and it's critical that we get to the experiences and voices of a diverse uh, a diverse array of people who have different experiences from different professions, different social, cultural, different ethnic and racial backgrounds to all contribute to the construction of these histories and narratives. And because, you know, like James is saying, visitors and students, we all have different lived experiences and that can, the student can be 18, the, the visitor can be 75, but they all have some way to contribute to what this story, what this experience, what this history actually is. And getting to the idea of, you know, a constructionist view of learning, we build upon our previous lived experiences. So when we're creating these projects, these, these exhibits, it's important for us to try and get as many voices to contribute to that construction as possible. Okay, great questions, let's yeah. see. All right, so Dr. Brock, you know, reading about some of your work, and I'm gonna quote you just a little bit. Uh, you've said, I think it's incredibly important now for historians and students who want to be historians to think about how their work is relevant for public audiences. I think there's a real hunger from the public to hear complicated stories about the past. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us some experiences you've had with the public and their desire to hear more about their own history? Sure, I think, you know, the, especially the, the point I made about um, the public actually wants to hear a complicated story, um, you know, and, and uh, a compelling story comes from one of my earliest experiences in the field. One of my first jobs in the field was as a, a part time docent at the Atlanta History Center. And I was based at the Tully Smith Farm, which if you've ever been there, it's a 19th century plains, plantation plains farmhouse. It's on the campus of the History Center. And, you know, we donned costumes of the era. Uh, luckily, it was not in first person interpretation because I'd be terrible at that. But, um, but we did lead tours of the house. And it, it was in the early 2000s. In fact, it was. I think I started the job in 2000. Um, and so it was a moment in public history where there was about to be a reckoning around interpretation of enslavement, Brandon, um, to your experience at plantation, uh, southern sort of southern plantation and, and southern plantation milieus. And so the the um, director of the house and um, his his assistant director were really taking pains to try to employ new kinds, uh, new methods of interpretation at the house that would especially focus on slavery, because before that, and, and this is to know, you know, I, I certainly this was at many places across the South and frankly still happens at some certain places across the South. There was a, a tendency to avoid confronting enslavement at the house. Um, and again, I was at, I was there at this moment where I saw that changing and I saw the administration sort of taking new directions. And one of those, one of the things that they employed was, um, his, you know, a kind of historical theater where um, there were African-American interpreters and we would have these kind of living history days in which um, the interpreters would act out vignettes, vignettes of, of kind of a daily life for an enslaved person, vignettes of, of escape um, and vignettes of kind of, of um, related to the Civil War and the Battle of Atlanta, which affected this particular home and site, um, even though it was moved from De DeKalb County. So um, I saw the public respond to that in a way that that was incredibly, I guess, gratifying. You know, it brought in new types of audiences. It got people talking. Again, this, this what we talked about, sort of historical empathy. You know, it, it really garnered that sense of, of kind of understand, of trying to understand a lived experience in a different way. So I, you know, that was inspiring to me as a young public historian who, you know, was still an undergraduate basically um, and didn't really know the field, didn't know the history of the field. But I think even in my own experience that I would say, yeah, that you you need to uh, offer full and complicated accounts of the past because the past was complicated. Um, and so I've seen that again and again in, in other places. But I would say, you know, working with community organizations and community groups has really certainly and I'm sure you all know this working in, in your settings, that the public has a hunger to know its own past. Um, you know, I'm I, one of the projects I'm working on that's been ongoing since about 2016 is a project with um, historic African American Episcopal Church that was rooted in Decatur, Georgia, but has now moved to Stone Mountain, Georgia, um, and that community came to work with historians because their, you know, their material culture had not been saved in the local archives, right? It didn't exist in local repositories. It had existed in the in the memories of their long-term members. It existed, existed in the attics and basements 
of their long-term members. And so we created a partnership uh, in which to find and digitize those materials. Um, and that project is carried on today uh, by church members and by other, you know, other um, public historians and based in Decatur. And there's a real, you know, there was a real desire to save and preserve that past that they didn't see at the local, you know, historical society. And again, not to sort of criticize here, but, but that's just the reality. So I think there is a hunger to, to understand the past and to preserve the past. And that's where public historians can, back to my, back to my sort of, um, you know, spiel about us being in some ways like extension agents, right? That's where we can serve the public, that ours is really a field of service. Uh, and that's, I think that's wonderful because there is that hunger to, 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 to do so by publics, many interested publics. Well, and you've, um, to, to kind of piggyback off that, you've, you've done a lot of international work as well with your, um, with your background in public history. Um, there was a, a project you were working on in Ireland recently. Um, how did, um, is, is that still ongoing? How did, how did that go? That, you know, thank you for asking about that. That was an exhibition that is now closed. It, it was open from um, uh, from November to March. Uh, that, you know, yeah, that that comes out of this work that I do with the Selvage Collective. Again, we're, we call ourselves a curatorial collective. We've been working together uh, for multiple years. We do often um, independent curatorial projects. And, you know, that really came about because one of our members, Teresa Bramlett Reeves, Dr. Dr. Teresa Bramlett Reeves, who's based at Georgia State, um, it had a, a Fulbright in Dublin at the Irish Museum of Modern Art and built these really interesting connections. One of those connections that she made was in Kilkenny, uh, Kilkenny Ireland, uh, close to Dublin, uh, at a contemporary art space that that previously was housed in a, um, a medieval castle in Kilkenny. It's such a cool space. I can't imagine living and work, working there. But they they were moving uh, to a 19th century almshouse, late 18th century, early 19th century almshouse. And Teresa became really fascinated by the histories associated with both places. Um, it turned out that the almshouse hosted a big that the founder of the alms house was also uh, interested in botany and on the grounds of this alms house which basically took in indigent in this case protestant former um, uh, domestic servants who were protestant and, and without family um, and and it, it was an active uh, active basically um, a home until you know the 1990s so it had this really fascinating history. And so we, we, we became fascinated by this metaphor of botanical grafting and how that could be a metaphor to tell the, the history, the complicated histories of Ireland related to colonialism, you know, related to uh, these kind of intertwined pasts. And so we sort of, we used contemporary, the work of contemporary artists to bring out those historical themes. And that's what we try to do. We, we blend kind of public history and contemporary art to tell historic narratives as another way to sort of, you know, talk about the past. Right. So it was a long winded answer to your question, but it went well. And, and we got a really interesting response from locals in Kilkenny and locals to the region, Kilkenny County, you know, coming in to talk about what that almshouse meant to them. Right. That they always knew it was there, but it was sort of hidden behind, you know, uh, groves and, and, and you know, stone walls. And um, and and now it was kind of it, it was opening up to the public in the form of this art gallery. And so it was this really fascinating way to engage through through contemporary art as opposed to kind of, you know, historic artifacts as we normally, which is what we normally, you know, work with to tell our stories. All right, I'm going to stay with the uh, with this with the international theme for a bit, and uh, really I want to follow that up and say, can you tell us about working and exploring public historical landscape in Morocco? That history isn't just one specific location or space; it could be an entire landscape. Uh, so, can you tell us about your historical landscape uh, work in uh, Morocco? Yeah, I mean, I think that you know that project was my first job uh, out of graduate school. And it was a really a fortunate job to land land because it, it involved um, managing the, a project that was already underway, a project that was funded by a, a grant program that's now unfortunately defunct, but it was with the uh, American Alliance of Museums called Museums Connect. And the project was um, funded by the State Department, which is really interesting, but it put a museums in the U.S. in partnership with museums across the world in a kind of a collective pro or a, a cooperative project. So this uh, this relationship with the Moroccan University, the University of Ben Seek in Casablanca was already, you know, in place, uh, this partnership between Kennesaw State and Ben Seek. But um, a, the grant was to fund a kind of a 
a, a multi-year um, study of attitudes about Islam in Georgia and attitudes about the West in Casablanca. And that research was undertaken by students. So Moroccan students from Ben Seek and, and public history students at Kennesaw State. And so that was really cool. So we built a website uh, that we, you know, that both teams used. And we we sort of came up to we came together sort of we we devised a project scope to to complete oral histories with people about attitudes you know about the West and Islam in our respective places, um, and we begin to kind of look at um, not so much the historic landscape as a place, but the the collect maybe landscape is you know thinking about collective memories of landscape right. This was about ten years after uh, the, the attacks on 9/11 on September 11th, and frankly, hostilities and Islamophobia was still running those sort of sentiments were running high uh, in the country. And so it was a, it was an interesting time to revisit um, the kind of attitudes um, of of our community members. And we we also traveled together, which was the, one of the coolest parts of the grant was that we took Kennesaw State students over to Casablanca. And we brought Moroccan students actually to Washington, D.C., to the kind of Mecca, our Mecca of museums, right, in, in D.C. And we all traveled together, talked about the museum landscape, talked about our work in tangent and how we might present our work together. Um, oh, thank you so much for bringing that site up. I should have shared that URL. It's still actively managed by uh, the Museum of History and Holocaust Education at Kennesaw State. But, you know, that was an amazing uh, project. It, it, and I think probably the, the legacy of that project exists in the continued uh, relationships with uh, our project partners in Morocco, our friendships that we built, and also professional relationships. So the, the MHHE in Kennesaw still works with the Ben MC Cultural uh, Museum um, that, that was really built from this project. So now Ben MC has its own museum based on the campus to kind of interpret the history of the Ben MC neighborhood, um, which is a, a sort of a fascinating place. So I think that, um, yeah, that was a, a, I wish that we could do more of that work. And, you know, frankly, even without all that grant money, we could have done that work because we have all these cool free virtual tools, you know, with which to do that. I know that UA has its own international relationships, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to build international public history partnerships here for those of us who might be interested in that, certainly for students who might be interested in that. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I, I love, uh, you know, history is everywhere, uh, not just here. We all have the opportunity to talk about it uh, everywhere. And the, the international part of this is, it's, it's just fun. I mean, one, it's informative. One, it creates meaning and you have these international co cooperations and can help us deal with, you know, historic memory, this collaborative memory that you talk to, which I think is one fun, but also really powerful. And that's a, a not only a privilege we have, but I think it's also a responsibility as civic and civic um, servants mm -hmm. to really explore these narratives. Um, Catherine, I'm gonna ask one of your questions, unless you, unless you like to, uh, about uh, you know public history program developing at UA. Mm -hmm. uh, would, you like to, would you like to take that question? Yeah, sure. So um, Julia um, joined the um, history department to uh, to develop a, a public public history program at at the university. Um, so as as you work to to put all of that together, how do you envision utilizing museums as a part of your curriculum in the future? Because UA has such a variety of uh, museums that um, uh, that are part of the university already. So how do you envision um, incorporating incorporating that into your curriculum as you develop your program? Yes. I mean, I can say it totally out of the gate that the Division of Museums is critical to the, any public history program that that unfolds here at the university. Um, critical as, you know, as a place as, as training ground for students, um, critical in building students networks. Right. Um, but also in modeling for students, you know, building relationships with you all has been so gratifying. And, you know, Dr. Bomar, uh, folks at OAR across the university has been so gratifying for me because it um, it, of course, it enriches my practice. Um, but it's also a way to model, how, you know, the ways that public history operates, which is multidimensional, multidisciplinary and collaborative. Right. And so we can model that for students just as much as, as we're resources to train them. I think we have to model that collegiality. Um, and partnership. Um, so I think, 
Yes. I mean, one of the reasons why I was so excited to come to UA was because the divisions of division of museums existed. I mean, it's 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 unique, I think, among Southern universities, frankly, SEC universities that we have this collection of diverse places in which uh, students could learn and, and grow within, you know. So I think it's absolutely critical. And I would say at the at the graduate level, you know, we are working with Dr. Bomar, um, and the director of the museum studies program to make sure, you know, Dr. Friel, that to make sure that it is as easy as possible for our graduate students in history to also um, uh, pursue the graduate certificate in museum studies. So we're lucky that we have a, this graduate certificate here on campus so that, you know, our master's students, many of whom are interested in public history. In fact, I, you know, we're getting maybe even a few more applicants who are interested in public history, largely because we have this museum studies certificate. That's certainly part of the draw. And so I think it's absolutely critical. And I just feel totally fortunate that you all are here on campus and, and the archival studies program too, um, uh, as well. So we, we have this kind of amazing public history community that's in place here. And I think, you know, we can train students really across disciplines, but certainly in public history. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's great. Um, I want to go back and just kind of talk about some of your other, other re research interests. We have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to touch on it just a little bit more. So one of your research interests include history of sporting and leisure. Mm -hmm. And I, it may have been your your master's work uh, was in South Georgia, North Florida. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that about right? Yeah, my dissertation work, but yeah. Dissertation, yeah. yeah and, and I'm curious about it, one, because I grew up down there. Uh, so yeah, could you could you tell us a little bit more about um, what, what that research actually was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that research actually came out of grew out of a public history project at FSU. I, um, you know, I FSU is in Tallahassee, Florida, North Florida, which is just it's very close to the Georgia border in Thomasville, Georgia, Thomas County. In fact, that whole region, the forty mile stretch between Tallahassee and, and Thomasville, is called the Red Hills region, and it encapsulates a few other counties um, just proximal to that. But I, I as a master's student there, I uh, it, it was hired by the Thomas County Historical Society, now the Thomasville History Center, to conduct an oral history history project of longtime residents there. And what became clear to me as I was doing these oral histories is that uh, there was a history of hunting in that region, uh, especially of quail hunting, that actually had a really interesting effect on the collective memory of residents from the Red Hills. So this hunting colony was founded after the Civil War, and it was largely uh, created by people from other parts of the country, uh, wealthy industrialists from the Northeast, uh, from the Midwest, guys from Standard Oil, guys from DuPont, you know, and their families discovered that this region of the country was incredibly uh, fruitful for quail hunting. So these were sportsmen, right? These, these guys were totally tied into this kind of emerging identity of, of sportsmen that were that was coming about, especially after the Civil War. And so they, they basically they moved seasonally down to, to the Red Hills and they, they would buy these old antebellum hunting plantations modernize them to some degree and they would pursue hunting. So they became really uh, kind of, um, you know, interesting community members, um, uh, transitory community members, and yet they had this huge impact on the collective memory of the region, especially when it came to race relations, which I found really fascinating. So the narrative kind of went that because there was this influx of Northerners who had different, uh, different historical experience with race and racism, they actually had a positive uh, benefit to the community so that when the civil rights came along in the mid 20th century, right, that Thomasville didn't have the kind of racial animosity that other parts of the South had. Of course, that's mythic, right? That, that's kind of a, a myth. I mean, certainly uh, that we can talk about the ways that Northerners approached race, but I became very interested in, in um, going back in time and looking at the, the hunting plantations as this kind of entity. Um, I interviewed a lot of uh, African Americans who had worked on these plantations. I interviewed white uh, residents who had uh, worked for these uh, plantations as well. And so I, I, I was really fascinated by the kind of social and economic impact that these that these uh, plantations had. But what grew out of that actually is more of a kind of a broad based interest in hunting in general. That I I sort of found that hunting is a really interesting way to explore the past, that it, it, you know, to sort of paraphrase another historian, Carl Jacoby, it is this really fascinating blend of social and environmental history. And so I'm working on a book now that is sort of builds from that dissertation, but is, I'm more interested in, in, in the, the bureaucratization of hunting that comes in the progressive era. So the, the creation of fish and game commissions in the South, in Alabama, Alabama had the first, in fact, uh, in the South of uh, Southern states, but looking at uh, Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi, 
sort of from the progressive era to the New Deal era and the ways that uh, hunting really transformed and became a part of a larger wildlife management schema. So yeah, I, I, that's sort of where I am. And I, I got to teach a history of hunting course this spring. And so my again, my students were my co-learners and sort of being able to dive a little bit more deeply and more broadly into themes of hunting in North America from the Pleistocene to the present. So it was this really kind of interesting <laughs> dive into deep, deep time, which is not, so I relied upon your colleagues in anthropology to come in uh, and from uh, and from the, um, the collections at OAR to bring in these amazing, uh, you know, like um, uh, points from Alabama, all kinds of points from, you know, the archaic woodland and Mississippian periods. Uh, it, it, so, so I was blessed again to have the Division of Museums <laughs> at the University of Alabama in that class. Yeah, that, that was a lot of fun. I feel like I could talk about just that one subject for another hour or, or so. That that would be a lot of fun to do a deep dive on. And I, I think one of the one of the more powerful things we've touched on is how collective memory can really guide and direct public policy. And I think that's that's a really important thing that we've hit on. Uh, but you know, uh, Dr. Brock, I think we're getting down to it. Uh, do you have any final thoughts or comments? Anything you'd like to talk about that we didn't really get a chance to? You know, I can't think of any, but I really commend UA Museums for doing these live streams and for keeping this amazing content going to the public. And it, again, it was an honor to be a part of this. So thanks, y'all. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you for coming on and, and being a part of it. Uh, I, I'm certainly looking at history in a new light after this conversation, uh, just thinking about uh, all the different ways that you can approach history. Uh, it, you know, it's not just in a history book. You can do it in so many uh, different ways. So I really appreciated the conversation that uh, y'all had this morning. Well, I guess uh, let's uh, wrap it up here. So I guess that's going to do it for this Museums from Your Home live stream. We've talked about history today, but we'll be doing this every weekday, Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. And each day that we do this will feature a different aspect of UA Museums. So tomorrow we're actually going to be talking about archaeology and more specifically the Alabama Indigenous Mound Trail with the Office of Archaeological Research. And uh, so that will be at the OA AR's Facebook page and Moundville's Facebook page, as well as the UA Museum's YouTube channel. So you can join us uh, in multiple places uh, tomorrow. And uh, let's see, uh, I know we like our fancy little um, little ticker here. So I'll put that up here while I do this part. Uh, so for a full live stream schedule and links to all of our educational resources, uh, we have some from Discovering Alabama. We have some from the Alabama Museum of Natural History. And we also have some from Moundville Archaeological Park. Uh, you can get all of the stuff that we have that we are are making available to you at museums.ua.edu slash museums from your home. That will be your one-stop shop for everything that we're doing right now with the live streams. We have the archived live streams there. We have the links to everywhere that you can watch all of these things. And we have all of our resources there. And if you are liking what we're doing here with these uh, streams, you can you can support UA Museums if you feel so inclined uh, by going to give.ua.edu slash museums. That's a good way to support us over there. And uh, I just uh, want to thank everybody who was on the panel today for sharing your knowledge and your enthusiasm about history with us. And thanks to everybody who was watching, who was watching live and who will watch it later. And for, uh, you know, thank you for visiting UI Museums from your home. Well, I hope everybody has a great day. I want to give a quick shout thanks, out. Everyone. My friend Rebecca's watching and my mug today is in honor of her. It says, I want buns of steel, <laughs> but I also want buns of cinnamon. So cheers, Rebecca. Thank you. Well, thank you. And Fair I think enough. I think we all, we all have that uh, goal in mind. So I, I appreciate it's it. My new, it's my new motto. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I guess we'll take that in with uh, the rest of our day. We'll have that mindset going into uh, what we do today. All right. Well, hope everybody has a great day. And uh, thanks for joining us. Bye, everybody. Thanks, have everyone. a great day.